Hello and welcome. My name is Julieta. I am the beverage director for the 5050 Group here in Chicago. Extra staff usually comes from lack of experience. Of the manager. Of the manager, yes. They get a little nervous, they want to put one or two more people on. So, and you're de you've damaged yourself, or you've damaged that day a little bit in two ways. You're spending more money on staff, and then you're cutting the tip pool. So the staff that is mm. uh, working that evening takes home less money, and they're not as happy about that. Mm. Hey guys, this is Sid Patel, CEO of Beverage Trade Network and Bartender Spirits Awards, and we are live in Chicago at Second City, Chicago location. I'm here with Juliera Campos, Beverage Operations Head of 5050 Group, you know, who have many establishments in Chicago, and we're going to talk about optimizing, you know, bar operations, which is really an expert at how to generate profits and, you know, where to look for, you know, wh where you're leaving money on the table, how to optimize your staff, how to optimize your cost and revenue. So, Julieta, thanks for having us here. Thank you so much for hosting me. Super. So let's start with you know uh, a business model, right, of a bar uh, cost structure. I think let's yes. go there. So like, how does a PNL look like? What are the main elements uh, you would put on the balance sheet? So definitely the cost of every cocktail, every wine, every beer. So I think that's kind of something standard that we all learn from uh, right at the beginning. Uh, some things that I see people are missing once in a while are garnishes, straws, napkins, all those little things mm -hmm. add up to quite a bit of money if you're not keeping track. Um, also measurements, actually, thank you for letting me bring my little cup. Um, measuring everything and measuring twice and cutting once. Um, have your bartenders and your servers always measure out their wine. Mm. Um, not everyone is perfect and especially when your store, your shop gets really, really busy, mm -hmm. uh, things get to things go by the wayside. So making sure that you have tools to help your staff stay on task, give you some accurate uh, measurements, will give you accurate P mixes, mm -hmm. um, and then it'll help you save, um, or at least know where, if you're struggling in an area, know where you can kind of look to to cut down on costs. Mm -hmm. And then uh, employee uh, wages would be one of the main costs as well, right? Yes. Uh, how do you optimize that? What are the, op the main, how do you, plan a shift? Absolutely. Um, I think I, I take it a step back, um, hiring the right people. Mm -hmm. um, not every job, not every location is for every person. So when in your interview, being as straightforward as you can be um, and making sure you have the right person on your team. Mm -hmm. For example, there are bartenders who work better at bars. Mm -hmm. Um, there are bartenders who work better at restaurants mm -hmm. where they know that the bar takes a step back, the kitchen takes a step forward. Mm -hmm. And finding out who you need on your team and then hiring that individual. Mm. Um, and also disclosing, one of the first questions I ask in an interview is, what do you need to make a week to be comfortable? Mm -hmm. So having those hard questions um, and conversations right away mm -hmm. so that you can es establish expectations mm -hmm. Uh, before even bringing them onto the team. This is one of our spaces. This is 1959 down in Second City. Uh, this is where we want you to come in, eat and drink before you come and enjoy the show. We've got a lot of tourists coming through these places um, and sometimes they wanna hang out. So one of the few things that we do is we wanna make sure that we have very comfortable seating. We are not rushing you out. We're not flipping tables. We want you to be here, hang out, maybe meet someone new and enjoy your evening. Um, another reason why we lay out the room we do, we want to make sure that it's optimal for the, your servers and your bartenders to give you good service and we don't want to crowd you. We want to make sure that, like I said, we have a lot of uh, tourists coming through. So it's about your family, sometimes it's about the business and we want to make sure that you have your allotted spot in this room. Great. Now I think, you know, we've, we've touched a little bit broadly on the cost 
right? And let's touch broadly on the revenue side of things because you also want to grow that. You want to grow the top line. Upselling is a great way to increase profits. Yes. You know, or maybe an average, your, your average bar is doing $6 a drink and let's aim at seven now, right? Yes. So w what are some things that, you know, if you were given a task, all right, let's increase 10% profit in next three months of this bar. What, how would you attack that? I think I attack it with two ways. Uh, one, education over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something strong that we look for in our programs. So right now, after the pandemic, mm -hmm. we have a lot of new bartenders, a lot of new barbacks, a lot of new managers mm -hmm. who rose through the ranks um, and they're doing a wonderful job, but they don't have those years of experience. They don't know every single scotch behind the bar. They don't know every single whiskey. Mm -hmm. So having a very rigorous education program where they get that access to information. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it looks different for everyone else. Some people are hands-on, mm -hmm. some people uh, prefer to have all that information in their phone. So finding out how your team learns is really important and kind of pivoting to make sure that you're matching that as uh, as a director. So education, I mean, uh, for sure makes sense, but how is it uh, exactly, how have you measured that, all right, you know, just you are a bourbon expert, you've put one here, yeah. and it's actually helping you with a faster sale or an upsell or, you know, a, a repeat buy. How are you measuring this? So upselling just through the PMIX. Okay. So one of the ways that I've been educating, we can take it to wine for a second. Um, if I want to educate you on Sauvignon Blanc, I'll have you taste what we have by the glass and then I'll present different varietals by the bottle. Mm -hmm. um, and that way with that education, you know when you approach a table, if they are drinking Italian, you can offer up an Italian Sauvignon Blanc mm -hmm. as opposed to something a little bit more traditional that they uh, are usually exposed to. So education is one. Now, what about marketing? What about, you know, happy hours? So just go over some things that you think really can help drive the top line as well. Absolutely. So marketing, finding out who your folks are, who you're actually created, who you've actually created the space for. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, with one of our one of our big whiskey uh, spaces is right in the middle of Chicago, which mm -hmm. has been a little bit quiet recently. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we're doing is we're engaging every single restaurant mm -hmm. and we're really lucky to have marketing dollars where we just had a casino um, we just had a casino uh, move in front and what we invited these guys for a 12 a.m. happy hour we know that their shift ends 12 at 12 a.m. 12 a.m. this is these are all the workers mm -hmm. they are bartenders they are servers they are blackjack yeah. dealers I know that you want to drink afterward and we've gone out there, we personally invite you. Yeah. We're not handing out get a free drink card. Yeah. You can make those cards. Anyone can mm -hmm. toss those cards around. But going up and sitting across the bar from someone and say like, hey, I want to host you and your team for a, for a 12 a.m. happy hour, drinks on us. Um, and then you get that staff, you get that full staff coming and then the casino, once you have those casino employees talking about you, They'll talk to each other about it, uh, mm. about you, and then they'll talk to their guests as well. So as you join me at the bar, you're gonna notice that we space out our seating. We wanna make sure that you feel cozy and comfortable, but at least um, just a little bit apart from the person next to you. We reserve about six inches between every chair. When it comes to our table layouts and our tables, you're gonna see that we have a lot of two tops. So with tourists, we either, like I said, we get groups of 10 or 20, uh, maybe two or three, four, uh, what we want to make sure is that we can move these tables to accommodate that group and maximize uh, the amount of people that get, we can get in here and maximize those profits as well. Can we give an example of, let's say you say, who is this bar for? Let's define and then yes. an example. So let's take this second city, you know, this particular concept, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, how have you defined your consumer here? Is it 25 to 35? What kind of, how do you define a who? And yes. then uh, what, how are you marketing outside the bar and inside the bar? How are we finding out who our guest is? Mm -hmm. um, we have very extensive EON notes. So end of night, um, at, uh, the manager gets on the computer and they'll report on the parties that we've had, the guests that we've had. Just a random notes. VIPs. Uh, we're or there is no. a software, there is a way to write this notes because it's a nice point, I mean. Yes, uh, there is a software, okay. yes. So we have certain sections dedicated to PMIXs, LBW PMIXs, uh, sections dedicated to issues, sections dedicated to VIPs. And then we get a good idea of who's coming in. All right. The more information you put in, the more that we know. Okay. For this concept specifically, we have a lot of folks who come in and out of, uh, who come in here who are not from Chicago. We get a lot of tourists. Mm. So we get a lot of couples, we get a lot of families. Um, we know that it's 18 and over, so mm -hmm. we're gonna have some non-alcoholic drinkers in the mm -hmm. crowd. 
Um, we also get a lot of business groups. So they come in, they do a conference, they want to do something special mm. for their team. They uh, book a whole show or they book 10, 20 seats. Um, and then we know that, hey, these folks are coming in from out of town. What beer do they drink? What mm. wine? And they're in front of their boss, so they're not going to be drinking very much. Um, what non-alcoholic should we have ready to supplement mm. that gap? Going into any location, it's about the experience. You've got to get the lighting right. You have to get the music right. You have to set a whole tone. Um, service and cocktails are wonderful. Service and drinks, really. Uh, but we want to make sure that you feel uh, you feel like at home, you feel like you can be here for a couple hours. This is your third space. This is a space where you can relax and you can enjoy a couple things along the way. Um, I know we've, been, we've all been to that restaurant where the music is too loud, the lights are too low, you can't read the menu. Taking care of those little details uh, is part of hospitality. Making sure that you center the guest at the experience, not just the drinks and the service, the whole experience is one way to make sure that your business stays afloat. And then uh, how are you marketing this tourist? Because at the end of the day, they're, they're, you know, they're coming as mm -hmm. an experience, uh, but how do, how do they know about you, your beverage programs? You know what, honestly, we, we're very lucky. They, folks know Second City more or less. Mm -hmm. uh, they come for the show, and what we're trying to do is we just want to supplement that experience. We want to make sure that we have, the good, uh, we have good cocktails um, for me. It's always a good cocktail consists of a drink that you are asking for two or three times. Mm -hmm. It can't be a one and done. You have to want to return to it for it to actually make it on the menu. Now, do you see the program that's running, uh, let's say on the stage, and then yes. c come up with themes or ideas uh, to sort of greet and start with a drink? Absolutely, I think those are some of our more successful cocktails is when it is inspired by the play. Okay. Um, oftentimes what we do, uh, just an additional thing, is we include a garnish or just a little take home memento. Mm -hmm. I think when everyone, when you go traveling, you always want to take something back and we mm -hmm. kind of include it for you. Gas sitting is also part of that experience. One of the things that you want to take into consideration is, is it family, is it business, is it how intimate do you, how intimate is this group? Um, one of the things is as a server, host, and a bartender, you're, you have to learn to read that right away so that you can give them that full experience. If it's a date, they might want something a little bit more private. If it's a family, um, I, would, I would center them really. If it's a group, I'd, well, I'd put them in the middle and make sure that they have access um, to have access to each other. And sometimes it depends with serving staff, you might have to ask your service to accommodate sections. What, what other elements do you think, you know, uh, where absolutely you've seen, you know, uh, people wasting money? Uh, sometimes excess staff is planned, but why do you think such things happen, you know? I think excess staff and having the wrong person in the right, wrong seat or someone who's okay. inexperienced. Extra staff usually comes from lack of experience. Of the manager. Of the manager, yes. They get a little nervous, they want to put one or two more people on. Yeah. So, and you're da you've damaged yourself, or you've damaged that day a little bit in two ways. You're spending more money on staff, and then you're cutting the tip pool. So the staff that is mm. uh, working that evening takes home less money, and they're not as happy about that. Mm. So lack of data and lack of experience, mm -hmm. and data experience and lack of systems. One of the things that we do here is we look at, we call it 24 hour scheduling. Mm -hmm. So we look at tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We look at what the weather is. We look at what the shows, we mm -hmm. look at how the show has performed throughout the week. Um, and we look at what kind of players we have on staff. Do we have strong people? We'll need less. Do we have folks who need a little bit more experience? We'll staff a little heavier. So you're, you're predicting because you're completely based on this kind of foot mm -hmm. traffic, right? Uh, so you have to sort of plan based on what's tomorrow, as you say. So now that we're behind the bar, this bar specifically has three stations. What we do when it's very busy, obviously we have three bartenders back here. What we have off to the end, far away from the door, is the bar that's servicing the room. That person is usually very, very busy and they have their head down. So you don't want them at the entrance. You want someone who has uh, less bar seats and less responsibility so they can be greeting people. Uh, maybe the host is away, maybe the server is away, but you want your well that's closest to the door to have the, la uh, the least amount of people to attend to. You want your well that is your service well far away so that person can focus on making cocktails for the room. When it comes to the back bar, uh, there are quite a few ways to go about it. One of the things that I like to do is I want to make sure that all my back bars 
within the same location are the same. That provides your bartenders with muscle memory and your guests, it's easier for them to find an item or uh, find an item if you've replicated it uh, times over. What about, let's touch base on the last segment of the buying products and inventories, right? Like yes. how effective is the buying and what are your principles on when you give a new brand a chance on the bar? What kind of things you look from from a supplier? Um, I think one of the things that has helped out in the last 10 years, we had some pretty strict bar managers or bar leads uh, that were at their peak um, and they asked the very hard hitting questions. Where's the whisking coming from? What's the mash bill? Who blended it? Uh, where are you sourcing the grain, all of that. Um, and they were very tough. I was very lucky to have one as a mentor um, and being relentless with that kind of information. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, tequila's very, mm -hmm. tequila is everywhere. All right. um, I'm from there. Yeah. So I know that the only thing that is appealing, uh, they always talk to me about the rolling hills, right? And how beautiful it is. And it's, it's a desert. <laughs> and I was like, the only thing that's pretty is like the women and the price of agave. Yeah. Um, so being able to be very strict, like what's your bricks level? When do you pull the agave? Why are you in the north? Are you in the south? Like, are you blending? Are you sourcing? Yeah. Being very relentless with those answers. And some of the things that they say right now is, uh, well, we have a female distiller and it's like, well, that's wonderful. I love women too, yeah. but they try to almost check off some boxes so that they look like they're doing work, Correct. but maybe they're maybe not as thorough as they should be. Correct. So being a little bit hard hitting yep. um, and making sure you get the answers that you need to feel good about the product behind mm. the bar. And sometimes you have to, at the end of the day, you kind of have to remember that it's not about you. Mm. It's also, it's a balance between uh, what you want to sell and what is being consumed. A couple more notes of being behind the bar. One of the biggest coaching moments that I've seen come across recently is the way you speak to people. Um, I call them these TikTok kids, but this new generation has a really hard time making eye contact. So when you are speaking to a patron, give them your undivided attention, make full eye contact, even if you have a room full of folks and people are calling out your name and uh, all sorts of things are happening around you, give that person the three, five seconds to make that, to engage and make that connection. It's gonna go a long way. Um, either by you're gonna either through memorizing their order or having them come back to you an order from you um, It really really is uh, It's important and you'll probably see in your bar tips, too What kind of support programs, you know, you think are effective for brands to offer you? I think marketing is very big cross promotion is huge So to drive foot traffic to drive for you, foot, like drive foot promote traffic, your, yeah. your bar that my brand is talked here happy hour today You know, we have a team something like that Exactly. Um, so anything through Instagram, okay. uh, like a feature like that, with, it's, it's wild how many influencers we get. Um, but someone who can drive traffic through your pages is always welcome. Folks who actually speak and join you at your locations. So if you are holding a business dinner and you come and have dinner at Kindling, um, I think that that's wonderful. That's what we're looking for, just mm -hmm. a little bit of exposure and just cross promotion because um, mm -hmm. they do have a big reach. Mm -hmm. and. That's something that, well, it doesn't really cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, on the brand performance, like yes. how do you judge a new brand? You know, after two months and nothing has moved, no one even has asked you about that drink. Uh, and maybe your people have tried a couple of times, but the taste and the repeat is not coming. What are some metrics you look at or completely just by the feel of things, you say this is not moving or there must be some data that you Yes. To get it out? Um, we, when we bring on a new product, there's about three or four of us. Okay. Um, sometimes I like something and no one, no one cares. Mm. No one likes it and that's absolutely okay. Mm. Um, it's about decentralizing and pushing what people, or pushing for what the crowd is going to want. If it's on the menu and it tinks, if mm. you will, if you've sold only 12, uh, 12 cans of a RTD, mm -hmm. um, then you pull it off. I think at that time we've already done the studies, we've done the education, we've done maybe a couple incentives across the group. We've called the brand up and said like, hey, this isn't doing very well. Mm. What have you done in the past? What has worked for you? Um, and once we kind of try all those avenues, if it's still tanking, then it might not just be for us. Mm. Um, and that's okay, not every brand is for every space. Um, when you open, or when you ask people to open or close a tab, 
um, here at Second City, it's pretty easy. If the show is going to go on in the next 10, 15 minutes, you do want to make sure that you offer that service. Hey, may I close you out so that you can enjoy your drink and not have to worry about an open tab. If you see that they're here for a big group, you want to facilitate everything for them, that's when you offer to keep it open. Um, honestly, it makes it easier on everyone around. Uh, any other growth hacks that you've, you've applied or maybe case studies that something different yeah. you did and okay that's your it has worked i see a lot of young bar managers wanting to open up their own bar mm -hmm. um that is a lot of money please run the numbers get yourself an accountant um count twice count once kind of deal um get someone who is good at numbers i have a lot of creative bartenders who are making very five dollar cocktails and selling them for 15 and mm -hmm. you're never going to get off the ground like that um, really find yourself a good mentor who can show you the business side and mm -hmm. who is very strict. That part I think is very important because everyone dreams of having their bar but when you get to the financial part a lot of people um, are kind of financially illiterate in that sense mm -hmm. and it's very it's a very it's a bit of a nerve-wracking thing to watch. Mm -hmm. um, they get these big finance folks who've made their money in a different uh, mm -hmm. industry who just want to maybe play house, maybe play bar for a little bit mm -hmm. um, and don't really know what they're getting into. Mm. It is quite a bit of work. Um, you're probably not going to, if you're lucky, you break even the first year mm -hmm. and then that second year is when you really get, get going. Mm. Um, having a low overhead, owning your space, not renting because all of the big restaurants in Chicago that closed during the pandemic, a lot of them were renting mm. and that's how those closures happen so quickly. Folks who were own, who owned were able to kind of uh, scrape by, and I think that was the huge difference that we saw in the last few years. So thank you for joining me here at Second City Chicago. We are very excited to be opening up Second City in New York, uh, coming soon in January 2024. And coming in May, I will be one of your spirit judges, so I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.